And now, please welcome Andrew Roche. Hello, everybody. Um, we're gonna, we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to get right into it. And I'm uh, joined here by my distinguished guest uh, on my far left, Maya Wiley, who is the counsel to the mayor of the city of New York. Steve Coonan, who is the director of CUSP at NYU. And Karen, um, I'm sorry, Karen, I just met. Karen Brandt. Yeah, Karen Brandt, that's right, from Co-Urbanize. And what we're going to talk about today is the fact that technology, as you know, is pervasive and everywhere, and it's starting to have a huge impact on our cities for good and for bad, but we're going to mostly focus on the good today, which is how it's giving us an opportunity to reinvigorate the way cities are organized, how citizens engage with, their, with each other and with their elected leaders, and how the cities can be redesigned in a 21st century way. And so without further ado, we're going to go right into this topic, and Maya, 22% of New Yorkers currently do not have access to high-speed broadband at home. When you look at the poverty line, it's almost 34%. Mayor de Blasio has made broadband access a pillar of his mayoralty. Why? As you know, and as I think everyone here knows, if you don't have a broadband access, a high-speed internet access, the vast opportunities that are available based on the internet of things are essentially not available to you. And it's not just job search, and it's not just interacting with government to get services. It's even the ability to incubate a indigenous tech ecosystem in your low-income immigrant community, which is something that at the end of the day, if what we want to do is create more equity in cities, and a lot of that 90 million, um, those 90 million people that Dan mentioned in his, in his opening remarks are immigrants, and they're immigrants of color. Uh, they're also, that 22% is disproportionately people of color. We have to actually think about how we grow opportunity and how technology actually enables that opportunity growth for all of us. So, quick question to the audience. How many people here have read a Terms of Service all the way through <laughs> before you clicked agree? Well, there's a couple of people who raised their hands. Well, there's a lot of people sucking up your data for good and for bad. Um, CUSP is focusing on how data can reinvent the way cities are managed, how they're, how they're, how they're designed, and how, they're, how that data can be used to change the relationship between cities and its citizens. So Steve, tell us a little bit about how data is really in reinventing the city landscape. If you really want to improve something, you need to measure it and understand it. Uh, so data are essential to improving cities. Cities have a wealth of data. We have data from the commercial sector. You can put sensors up, as we're doing in CUSP. And most importantly, there's open data. There has been a movement in government, starting at the national level and now down at the city level over the last five, six, seven years, to start to make available all manner of city data. And in fact, if you go to the New York City website, opendata.gov, NYC, uh, you'll find about 1,300 data sets there. To be frank, though, they are of varying quality and utility. The uh, Pluto data set, for example, is extraordinarily useful and well, well used, the tax lot data. Uh, but you can find other data sets that you don't even know what they are. And so just putting the data up uh, is only the first step in the process. The data needs to be clean. For example, the taxi data sets, which are available, there are 180 million taxi rides a year in New York City. And for the last five years, we have the start, stop, time, fare, tip, medallion, driver number for every one of the rides. But some of those rides start in the middle of the East River, right? So they're clearly errors that need to be cleaned up. <laughs> the data need to be interoperable. There are at least four different ways of denoting buildings in New York City. They need to be able to work together. So that's the second thing. The data needs to be clean and interoperable. And then finally, context is really important. The notion that a good data scientist can just take the data and produce startling insights is largely fiction. You need to get to know the operators. For example, who knows that the taxis change shifts at 4 o'clock every day, right? Yeah, OK, people do, because you all live here, right? We're all using Uber yeah, now. All right. But if you were some data scientist sitting in Silicon Valley, you probably wouldn't have that contextual information. So we need partnerships with the city, with academic institutions, non-governmental organizations in the community, and the private sector 
to learn how to optimize these data sets to be able to use them to improve cities. So Karen, um, at Civic Hall, where I'm from, we have a theory which is that you should design with, not for, if you want to be successful and demonstrate a potential solution or an innovation or to scale it in some way. And so real estate developers and city planners are starting to realize that they should be interacting with the people who are going to be most affected or most helped by the projects they're working on. So you, you're, you've been a pioneer in sort of building a platform that helps that happen. So tell us about it. Yeah, so I would say that there are first two main challenges to democratizing city building. Uh, the first, I don't think it's any secret that there's a real lack of trust between developers and community members. It's really hard to visualize. Really? Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Uh, it's really hard to visualize how a project's going to impact your neighborhood. You know, really understanding the traffic study, the wind study, shadow study, all of those things. And then the second thing is it's, it's really hard for people to attend public meetings on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. If you have young children, if you work two jobs, if you really like ne Netflix, it's, it's just hard to show up, right? Um, so I'll give you two examples of how some of our development partners have been using technology to help city building. So the first is Boston Properties. They're a very large real estate developer. Um, they were building a tall residential project in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they really decided to shift the relationship that they had with the community by being much more transparent. So they used Corbinize to do visualizations of traffic, shadows, wind, parking, so people could start to really understand, how is this going to affect my street? And what we saw is that that shifted the relationship between distrust to starting to actually work together with the community to then let's talk about public benefits, bikes, pharmacies, and different types of retail that people wanted. Um, and then the second example is the city of Boston. Um, so I know we're in New York, but Boston still has some lessons for us to learn from. Um, so we work with the Department of Neighborhood Development and they use Corbinize to make it really transparent all the development that's occurring on city-owned land. So you can go to their website, see a map of all the projects, new affordable housing development in the city. Um, and what they do is they make it very easy for residents to see when a new project's going to be happening in their community. Developers can understand what's going on, what they can bid on. And then all of those conversations can happen online. So people can write in comments on their phone, um, it, it becomes very easy. We see lots of comments coming in in multiple languages. Um, and so you start to see that even though people not, might not be able to attend meetings, they can still participate. So citizen engagement um, isn't just about real estate. It's about a lot of different things. And the mayor's office just recently did a project, which is to ask New Yorkers to give ideas and feedback regarding the bail system in New York. If you aren't aware, many times people who are only have a $500 or $1,000 bail can't actually even make bail. So they sit at Rikers. And um, very often they sometimes cop a plea because they just they need to get back to their families or back to their lives. And so they, even though they're not guilty, they cop a plea, which then sits on their record and, and tarnishes their lives forever. And so the mayor is now using an outreach program, crowdsourcing, to get ideas from the public. Um, is this a one-off, or is this something that the, is the, the, the city planning on doing this more often? Uh, so let me just start by saying the mayor himself is someone who actually believes deeply in and has long been a part of community organizing. And so for this administration, that kind of community engagement is actually fundamental to the ethos of the administration. So it's both looking at how we engage. Civic engagement is really about how we're all able to collectively identify problems and solve them together. That, to me, is at the core of civic engagement. So this is not a once-off. It's actually just one example of many in which the administration is trying to figure out how to have better not just community engagement, but actually community activity around problem identification and problem solving. So it's in addition to the crowdsourcing on bail, it's sending out a call for uh, innovation in the context of broadband and its expansion. It's having different ways for residents to use a mobile app to communicate with gov government about problems that citizens are seeing. 
uh, to, let do, to let us know what's going wrong that we need to identify. So I would say the short answer is our public engagement unit is constantly working with our digital team, and we are constantly thinking about all the levers of government in which we are more actively creating that relationship and using technology to further develop and advance that relationship. And there's one other major benefit, a byproduct of that, is that it actually helps a public awareness of the issue. Even That's if exactly you're right. not directly affected, I wasn't quite aware of the statistics until I actually saw the outreach. And so if you need to get build political capital in order to get a policy change or to get a legislative fix to a long-standing problem, it isn't just about getting feedback, it's actually building up public support. And engaging the tech community, as you know, for Meetup and using things like big apps to say, tell us what you think are the applications that will better engage the public. Right. Steve, my favorite app on my phone is something called Exit Strategy, mm -hmm. which is a really simple app if you don't have it. It basically will tell you where to stand on the platform of a subway so that yeah. when huh? you get out, the stairway that you want is directly in front of you. Mm -hmm. And when the brother-sister team from Brooklyn mm -hmm. wanted to do that project, they contacted the MTA and asked for the data about where all the exits are. And then the police department chimed in and said, we're not going to give you that data because that's a security risk. So they literally rode the subways to all 400 and some odd stations and literally mapped it yep. themselves. Yep. And now they sell that app for about I think three or four dollars have made millions of dollars We're doing it for other cities around the country. But the issue here is, is that there's this opportunity between public data which is collected by the government and data collected by citizens which then delivers a new civic asset, a new civic platform. And you were saying before that some of the data is dirty and not clean and not optimized and not necessarily, but there's still this tension between what I think public policy people sometimes think of is that the public's passive. We, we are here to serve the public, as opposed to thinking that the public is actually a partner and sometimes can come up with an innovation, big apps being an example, which we couldn't think of ourselves. So where, as you see this rolling out, as cities become more and more smart about their data, do you see them also embracing the notion that public data collected by the public is sometimes more valuable than even the data that the city collects with its agencies? So, so certainly there are multiple sources of data. The city data itself, proprietary data, public data, uh, I'm not sure everybody in the public wants to run around and, and take pictures or whatever it takes in order to generate the data. However, if you can provide apps that produce that data more or less automatically, that's great. But there are tensions. There's proprietary issues. The corporations want to hang on to the data because there's money in it. There are obviously privacy issues that are very deeply intertwined in this whole discussion. And then there are security issues. People don't want to give up the data. I like to say the second most basic human urge is to hoard data. And, <laughs> and that's true of the government. We, we can discuss number one some other time. Um, that's true of the government. I'm actually hoarding the data about uh, number uh, one. Uh, yes, right. <laughs> the, the academics hoard data because it's academic priority. And obviously, the companies hang on to the data. So, Getting all the data sets together is a major task in this business. But let's give a couple of simple examples. So at New York Tech Meetup a year ago, a doctor, an emergency room doctor, showed up and told a story about a 45-year-old man who died of a heart attack on the streets of New York, and no one realized that it was a defibrillator literally 15 feet away. Right. So she created an app that allowed people, as they came across a defibrillator, wherever they were, to map it, to, so that there would be a map available so people could find the defibrillators very, very quickly. Right? That's not going to, that's not, I mean, that's, yes, there are some privacy issues when you download that app because she's going to have a term as a service too. But the issue there is, is that there's all these opportunities where the, the complicated ones, you know, the issues that you brought up aren't necessarily the issue. It's the fact that people aren't even aware that these tools are available. That's true. And of course, you have to have the app. And by God, her data better be accurate because if I went to look for one that wasn't there, uh, there's trouble, right? So. Quality of the information is very important. Uh, and you know that's conjugate in some ways or, uh, with crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing data is not always good. Somebody's got to pay attention to getting it right. Correct. OK, so Karen, you know, you're obviously using your platform to get feedback. And Maya would point it out that some people actually don't have access. Um, but they're just, in, very, in many cases, real estate development actually affects those without access more than any other group. So how do you overcome the fact that your platform allows for a lot of online interaction for people who aren't necessarily online? 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a question that we think about all the time. Um, so one of the most recent projects that we had um, is actually a development where there's, um, it's a neighborhood urban renewal plan and there's going to be over a million square feet of new development affecting one neighborhood. It's enormous. Um, so what the developers did with Corbinize was really interesting. They put signs throughout the area um, that asked people questions like, what kind of retail would you like at this corner? What do you think about a new building here? What should it be? What would make you come out during your lunch break to this area? Um, and people could walk by, pedestrians, pull out their phone, whether it's a smartphone or not, and text in answers. And then those answers all got populated on the project page on our online platform. So after people participated, they got a text message back that said, you know, go learn more about the project and see all the comments. Um, so it started to grab people who were just walking around in a space. But those are the exact people that you want to start shaping your project because they're the people that are on the ground. And it's very unlikely that those people even know about the, a project that's happening or know about a meeting. So we're really focused on grabbing people in the physical spaces where projects are being talked about. Got it. Can we, one quick point that's important to equity here is also what questions are we asking? Not just how, so, and, and is there value assumptions in the data? Mm -hmm. Because when we start looking at a diverse city, uh, the question about what would make your neighborhood one that you could continue to live in. That's a very different question from what would this building look like. Uh, and in addition, when we see some applications that are making value assumptions in how they're crowdsourcing the information that sometimes to some become offensive. Um, now that's not a bad thing, that's a tension that we think that this process should help us solve. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so important to answer your question robustly, Andrew which is for those who typically do not have access to the infrastructure, how are we not just giving them an app that they can use on their mobile phone, but how are we making sure they're able to shape the discussion, mm. identify the questions, and add some of their normative uh, values to the, de the definition of the data? Good. So Steve, uh, you're working with the mayor's office on neighborhood innovation labs? Right. Tell us about it. Uh, so, um, you know, cities are complicated systems, infrastructure, environment, people, all interacting together. And one of the classic ways of understanding and hence improving complicated systems is to take a small part of it. And we at CUSP under Constantine Contacosta, who's our deputy for education, are partnering with the related companies to instrument Hudson Yards, infrastructure, environment, people. That has blossomed into an effort that the city is now leading, neighborhood labs, where we, the city would identify five neighborhoods in the five boroughs, and we would focus intense attention on those sensors, records, and so on, in order to really understand how those neighborhoods work, understand how the people are thinking, feeling, and give us some insight into how we can improve them. Uh, clearly, privacy issues are paramount in doing that, and we are learning how to navigate those, but that detailed understanding, feedback, from these neighborhoods, we think it will be a landmark set of studies to help us improve cities. Maya, when I ran in 2005 for public advocate to make New York City a wireless city, I only got 4% of the vote. Now you'd get 44. Mm -hmm. so Still not enough to win the mayoralty, <laughs> but very happy that Bill de Blasio was one of the few people who supported me when I ran. But I was trying to explain to people then that it wasn't just about people being able to open their laptops in a park and getting online, that once you had a wired city, you basically laid an entirely new infrastructure so things could talk to things. You could, you, essentially, you could imagine a city without traffic or you know, people would know when their buses and subways would arrive, not just the, one, the few subway lines now that tell us. So just give us a little bit of a vision of how you see the broadband being more than just about connecting people online. So critically important is one, that we make sure that the folks who are typically less able to be connected get connected, and we're doing that by establishing free high-speed internet Residential corridors, we've already identified five NYCHA developments where we are going to be rolling this out. But it's not just that we have those corridors, it's actually that we think about what's the relationship between those wireless corridors and what residents need to do and want to do and how they utilize it. But also then how do we use our public-private partnerships like Link NYC, as Dan mentioned, which is free wireless hotspots to create and start to link a network of networks 
um, but also use those networks that, are, that become social networks, not just physical networks. So it's everything from leveraging how we're using computer technology now in schools uh, to giving kids the opportunities to learn to be part of a tech talent pipeline to how we support a Majora Carter in the South Bronx to create a South Bronx tech ecosystem that's indigenous to tech. So it's really about how it's, as you say, Andrew, the pan and not a slice of the pie, but that it really holds all the opportunities that we can help support real people to engage in, to innovate, to solve the problems and create the opportunities they need to create. So we have to wrap up. I invite all of you to help convert the greatest city in New York, the uh, greatest city in the world, New York, in the 20th century into the greatest city in the world in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.